Well, good morning and happy Valentine's Day. We're now going to open God's word together. We're going to hear about a God who loves us more than you will ever imagine. Before we do that, let's just bow our heads and pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you love every single one of us. And thank you that your love is expressed partly in speaking to us through your word, the Bible. And so we pray, Lord, that whether we're new to these things and find it very confusing, or perhaps are very familiar with your word and tempted to to undervalue it, we pray you'd help us to concentrate and to hear your loving voice speaking to us through the words of the scriptures now as we turn to the book of Job. Lord, you know the struggles and uh, condition of our hearts. Please speak to each of us as we have need now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Many will know that a former member of staff at this church, Ben Shaw, has for uh, more than 18 months now been suffering from an aggressive cancer in his jaw. Having stepped back from leading his church in Putney, despite various operations and treatments, sadly the tumour has grown. And so Ben and Karen have now returned to Sydney, where Ben is receiving fierce chemotherapy, but realistically doesn't expect to survive the year. What are we to make of that as Christians? I mean, you'll not meet a lovelier Christian couple anywhere serving wholeheartedly in gospel ministry. Why would God allow one of his precious children to be struck down like this? Their WhatsApp groups, incredible, constantly praying for healing and sharing comforting Bible passages with them. So why doesn't God heal Ben? The descriptions of his constant pain and nausea are pretty harrowing. Yet Ben and Karen's confidence in God's love and in his promise of eternal life seems stronger than ever. How is that possible? We all need to know how our faith can survive through suffering. Because many of us are suffering right now. And even if we've never known a day of sickness, we will all suffer eventually. And we will all watch other people suffer and want to know how to support them. Indeed, as we struggle through a global pandemic, this is as good a time as any to think about faith in suffering. So today, we begin a new series of sermons in Job, which Christopher Ashe describes in his wonderful commentary as a neglected treasure of the Christian life. And that's because, introducing Job, it's about faith which survives through suffering. Job invites us to consider four main issues. First, the God who allows his people to suffer. Unbelievers sometimes challenge the Bible's revelation of God as both sovereign and loving with the reality of suffering, suggesting that either God is not sovereign because he clearly can't stop the suffering, or God is not loving because he clearly doesn't stop the suffering, and in either case, he's clearly not God after all. Indeed, faced with the crushing realisation that in judgment upon our human rebellion, our sovereign and loving God allows unspeakable human cruelties, like the Holocaust or rape, and horrific natural disasters, like tsunamis or bone cancer. Some false teachers will say that God is not in control. For example, in his book, The God Who Risks, Sanders writes, When an individual inflicts pain on another individual, I do not think we can go looking for the purpose of God in the event. I know Christians frequently speak about the purpose of God in the midst of tragedy caused by someone else, but this I regard to be simply a piously confused way of thinking. That's totally wrong. Reducing God's sovereignty like this denies his divinity. Divinity. 
The possibility that such challenges fail to consider is that our sovereign and loving God has such a great purpose in allowing suffering and such a glorious future beyond suffering that we will all eventually consider our suffering worthwhile. We read of this great purpose when Paul famously explains, in all things God works for the good of those that love him and have been called according to his good purpose to be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8. In other words, in suffering we become more like Jesus, which is a wonderful thing. And Paul writes about the glorious future prepared for us beyond our suffering, when after describing his own incredibly intense persecutions, he writes, we don't lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles. I mean, he was intensely persecuted. It says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all, 2 Corinthians 4. In other words, that beyond our suffering, there is so much joy forever in the presence of God, the sufferings of this short life, however horrific, will seem to us to be trivial. Now, with this Bible background... The book of Job does not hide God allowing Satan to hurt his beloved children. Job will confront us with this sobering reality. But notice how James summarizes the book of Job when James writes in the New Testament these words. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, James 5. In other words, Job is about Job's patient perseverance, but it's also about what the Lord did in the end, which demonstrates his wonderful compassion and mercy. And so however we want to express God's sovereignty in our suffering, we must remind one another that it leads in the end to his compassion and mercy. So Job will confront us with the reality of God who allows his people to suffer. Secondly, it brings us to the world of suffering that we live in. Job is brutally honest about this world. All around us, people who don't care about God or other people live happy and carefree lives. While people who really do love God and other people are often afflicted with tragedy and misery. Job puts it like this in chapter 21. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not upon them. In other words, Job is asking, why does God allow the injustice of innocent suffering? For example, just thinking of others who've once served in our church. Think of the Dawson family, with children inexplicably afflicted with incurable and debilitating migraines. Or the Snow family, recently believed when their baby Monty died of Edwards syndrome. Or of the Honeyball family, just uh, last week, uh, Vili, who once served here with our Afrikaans congregation, dropped dead at the age of 44, leaving a wife and two young children. And of course, within our own church family today, there are many that I won't name who are suffering from depression, from incurable disease, from infertility, from infant death, all manner of troubles. Wonderful Christian people engulfed by sadness and pain. The book of Job speaks about this. It's an agonizing account about suffering people for suffering people. It's not for philosophical speculation. In fact, that's why the book is so long and it's structured like a deep sandwich. Instead of jumping from the problem of Job's uh, suffering in chapters 1 to 3, straight to the solution in chapters 32 to 42, we're invited on an incredibly painful journey 
through Job's tortuous conversations with his unhelpful friends. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, in chapters 4 to 31, there's this huge middle section that brings us on a journey through Job's prolonged suffering. Because real suffering is tortuous and confusing. And this book refuses to offer simple soundbite answers on a postcard for the armchair questions of theologians. It's written for the wheelchair questions of people who are living in the long night of the soul. And that's why Job is 95% poetry, because it's not written for argumentative minds. It's written for weeping hearts. Job also speaks about the church we need to become. God's word in Job must shape our church as well as our individual lives. You probably know that many churches around the world are infected with what's known as the prosperity gospel that is promising health, wealth and success to all who trust in Jesus. In cities like London, where people already enjoy substantial material prosperity, this message often morphs into a therapeutic version, promising emotional satisfaction and personal fulfilment in Jesus. You'll be happy if you come to Jesus. Yet Jesus calls his followers to take up our cross in painful sacrificial service for the salvation of others. Jesus promised hostility and persecution, not happiness and popularity. Now don't mishear me. There's sweet joy in our salvation, but not without suffering. Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice, that is our salvation, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And so as we look forward with excitement to our new building and aspire to be a church which resources other churches, we may be tempted to quietly want to look impressive and feel successful. Job will remind us that God may allow us to be afflicted by Satan with intense suffering. And while we seek to love people with the excellence of our ministries, we will never be more than a church of broken people for broken people. Now, we won't need to catastrophize each other and exaggerate problems when in fact we're coping well. And we mustn't be distracted from Christ's great commission to grow disciples of all nations for Christ. We're not an NHS hospital ship full of nurses offering therapeutic care that must end at death. We're the crew of a lifeboat, reaching people who are drowning in sin with the glorious gospel that saves people from hell for heaven forever. But Job will puncture any sense of superiority we have by reminding us that many of us in this boat are really struggling and we need each other's help which is a good thing, because a loving church family is an attractive church family. Do you remember in Acts chapter 6, there were three things happening in Jerusalem when we read of the early church and the word of God spread and the numbers of disciples increased rapidly. In other words, if you want to know what has to happen for growth in people becoming Christians at our church, well, three things happened. Teams were carefully appointed to an address an injustice. So that secondly, the Bible teachers could, could concentrate on excellent preaching. And thirdly, the needy were properly cared for. Job, you see, will teach us to be a church that cares for one another well. And in so doing, we will become more relevant to our non-Christian friends and neighbours when they're suffering and wondering if God could be the comfort they really need. And fourthly, Job speaks about the suffering saviour we all need. He speaks about the God who allows suffering. He speaks about the world that we live in. He speaks about the church we need to become, but it speaks about the saviour we need. Christopher Ash observes in his commentary, the more I've bashed my head against the text of Job year after year, the more deeply I'm convinced 
that the book ultimately makes no sense without the obedience of Jesus Christ, his obedience unto death on a cross. Job is not every man. He's not even every believer. There's something deeply extreme about Job. He foreshadows one man whose greatness exceeded even Job's, whose suffering took him deeper than Job, and whose perfect obedience to his father was only anticipated in faint outline by Job. The universe needed one man who would lovingly and perfectly obey his heavenly father in the entirety of his life and death, by whose obedience the many would be made righteous. That is Jesus. Job reveals God's delight in the beautiful faith of one innocent man who will trust and love God even when all his blessings are removed and he is plunged into the most desperate suffering. That's why I've called this sermon series on Job the wisdom of the cross. For in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, if Proverbs teaches us that wisdom brings blessing, and it generally does, if Ecclesiastes teaches that wisdom lives with paradox, which it must, if Song of Songs teaches that wisdom is beautified in passion, as it is, and Psalms that wisdom is personified in God's despised king, Job teaches that wisdom is found in a faith that survives through suffering, that is seen perfectly in Christ, suffering for us on a cross. In other words, Job is chiefly about Jesus. Well, with that lengthy introduction, now let's briefly turn to the text itself. And I'm going to have Pete help me read various parts of the text as we just uh, dip into the first couple of chapters of Job. And I'd so much encourage you to, uh, to read this yourself. So can I ask you to turn to the Bible passage in Job chapter 1, or find it on your device. And firstly, we begin setting the scene. There was once a good man... And Pete's now going to read chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Thanks, Pete. So Job, chapter 1, from verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So this book is about a man called Job who lived in Uz in ancient times. In other words, outside Israel and before redemption history got going. We read here that he was blameless, that is, in integrity, he was upright, that is, honest. He feared God, that is, he was reverent. And he shunned evil. He is repentant from his sin. In Ezekiel 14, he's listed with Noah and Daniel as men counted righteous by God in Christ. In other words, Job was an early believer. And so, as we might expect in God's world, this good man was greatly blessed by God. He was given a full family with a wife and 10 children and a hugely successful agricultural business. He had vast flocks and many servants. He was, we read, the greatest man in the East. Perhaps like Super Bowl megastar Tom Brady is today in the West. But most impressive of all about Job were his spiritual priorities. In verse 4, when his sons hosted family birthday celebrations, happy times, Job would get the family up first thing in the morning. You can imagine them complaining about that. But he wanted to offer a sacrifice for each of them for any sin against God in their heart. 
Job was above all concerned that his family would genuinely love God and be forgiven for their sins. What a model for dads today he is. To care above all that our families love God and are forgiven for their sins. So much, we're so concerned for our kids, not that they can play violin or tennis, but that we drag them to the Bible after dinner and to church every Sunday and earnestly pray for them that God would be satisfied for their sin by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So here is a great man. He's not a perfect man, but he's a good man who loves God. And now we're invited up from the earth to God's heavenly throne room to witness something truly extraordinary. In God's heavenly throne room, God gave Satan a shocking permission. This is verses 6 to 12. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going to and fro on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Clearly, God rules through heavenly beings, once including a rebellious evil angel called here the Satan, literally the enemy. Our world, you see, is not governed by a a pantheon of gods in competition, as Hinduism seems to suggest, but by one living God. But God does not rule alone, as Islam seems to suggest, but involves supernatural creatures in the heavenly realms. Clearly, they must present themselves before the Sovereign Lord to receive their instructions, for they must do exactly as God commands. God is identified repeatedly here as the Lord in capital letters, which is the name of the redeeming God who revealed himself to Israel. He requires Satan to report where he's been. And Satan replies somewhat evasively, roaming throughout the earth. God invites Satan to consider his loyal servant, Job, who in his loyalty condemns Satan's rebellion. Now, Satan is malicious and evil, but he accurately observes that God has always protected and blessed Job. He points out that God would be most glorified as worthy of love in Job's life if those blessings were removed. For then the world would see that Job loves God for who he is and not for the stuff that he gets. Now, since the glory of God in heaven and earth is actually more important than our human comfort, God grants Satan permission to afflict Job by removing his blessings, but not yet to harm Job himself. Now, this permission was only given to Job and not to all humanity, not for all humanity. So the horrors about to come on Job have not come upon any of us. But we do learn here that for his glory, God may allow Satan to afflict us for a while to prove our loyalty to God through suffering. For as Peter later explains, trials have come, he writes, so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, suffering is the season in which we can demonstrate our faith most clearly. Suffering is when God is most glorified in us 
and for which we shall both be most rewarded in heaven. So this is not selfish of God. He is using Satan's hatred to glorify himself in Job, which will bring great joy in heaven and on earth, and does as we now read about his faith, and great reward in heaven. So for us, suffering is our opportunity to keep trusting God, which glorifies him in heaven and on earth, not least as other people watch us, clinging to him in the midst of our suffering. It's amazing, as I read about uh, Ben and Karen, how powerful their witness is to other people who watch their faith through their suffering. And so Satan is sent out to afflict Job terribly on the earth. So now we come down to Job's life. He experienced terrible loss, flocks and servants and children. This is now verses 13 to 20a. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. You can hardly believe it, can you? I mean, one day a messenger arrives with terrible news of a terrorist attack. The Sabaeans from Arabia have stolen all his oxen and donkeys and killed the servants tending them. While Job is still processing this shock, another messenger arrives with more terrible news of a freak lightning storm, which has killed his flocks of sheep and the servants tending them. A third messenger arrives to announce that bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen all his camels and killed all the servants tending them. The greatest man in the east is now bankrupt. His entire workforce has been slaughtered. But even as he tries to grasp the scale of these disasters, a messenger arrives with the most devastating news of all. The roof of his oldest son house has collapsed and killed all ten of his children. I mean, we can only imagine the trauma engulfing poor Job. How will he respond to such appalling loss I mean, stricken with grief, he tears his robe, symbolic of his broken heart within him. He then gets up and shaves his head, signifying his desperate mourning. Here is a man just overwhelmed by sorrow. And then, far from rejecting God, he falls on the ground in worship. Rather than running from God, he runs to God in prayer. And he prays with great reverence words that are so familiar because we read them at funerals today. Listen to these words, Job's first faithful conclusion. This is chapters, chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Do you see, having lost everything, Job speaks as if he himself has died. It's as if his life has ended. And without anger, he acknowledges that all the blessings of his life, his family and his prosperity, were granted by God. And so God is entitled to remove them. <laughs> 
But whether he has everything or nothing, the Lord remains worthy of his praise. And so Satan is humiliated and God is glorified. For even in the most intense loss, Job will not sin with criticism of God. We think at this point he's passed the test. And yet worse is about to come. We return to God's heavenly throne room now in chapter 2, where God gives Satan a further shocking permission. This is chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going to and fro on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Another day when God gathers his heavenly cabinet, he challenges Satan again to consider Job, for there is no one on earth like him. A third time, Job is described as blameless and upright, who fears God and shuns evil. He has maintained his integrity through suffering. Once a rich man, now a poor man, but he still worships God. He's maintained his integrity through suffering, which Satan clearly had hoped would destroy him. But to the contrary, it has glorified God. And so Satan issues a further challenge to God's glory by suggesting, he begins with a phrase, by the way, skin for skin, which is a phrase that nobody really understands what it means. So I don't know what that means. But then Satan expresses that if God, uh, that Job will reject God if his own health is afflicted. In other words, he's saying, yeah, but all you've done is take away what Job had. If you actually afflict Job himself, he will curse you. Well, shocking as it sounds, since it's good for the heavenly realms to witness God's glory, God gives Satan limited power now to afflict Job personally, but without killing him. And so now we return again to Job's life. He experienced terrible personal misery, painful sores all over his body. This is verses 7 to 9. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Can you imagine the scene? Now Satan himself strikes Job directly with terrible sores all over his body. There's no part of his body free from the pain. It's so painful, he's driven to, driven to scratching at the sores with a piece of broken pottery. Can you picture him there? He's so diminished, he's sitting in the ashes of the town rubbish dump where dead bodies were burned. Here is the, the man who was once a great and wealthy man sitting in the rubbish dump covered in pusculent sores, scratching himself, tears occasionally trickling down his face. Of course, Jesus would one day be crucified in a rubbish dump such as this. He's lost everything, and now he's personally suffering. And like Adam before him, the final temptation comes from his nearest and dearest, his own wife. Grief-stricken herself and horrified by Job's suffering, she utters Satan's temptation herself. Curse God and die. And so now Job really is all alone in his faith. 
and yet he still loves God. Look at Job's second faithful conclusion in verse 10. He says, you're talking like a foolish woman. In other words, this is not like you, darling. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. You see, Job remains content to trust his creator who has previously blessed him and has now sent suffering. Of course, he doesn't know, as we know, that his faith is being tested to demonstrate for all eternity the worth of God, contrary to the accusations of Satan. But he does know that God is still good. And although he doesn't understand what is happening or why, he's willing to trust God in the midst of his struggle. The question arises, of course, is this what God and Satan are doing in our sufferings today? Oh, we need to be careful here. Job's experiences were extreme, from extravagant riches to absolute destitution. He lost everything and all his ten children in a single day. Now, we will never experience such extreme blessing nor such extreme suffering, for Job points primarily to Jesus, who came from a yet higher place in the glory of heaven to a yet lower place suffering for our sins on a cross. And Revelation 12 tells us that when Christ broke Satan's power on the cross to condemn us under God's law, Satan was cast out of heaven, down to the earth, and so no longer has access to God's throne room. So there are no such discussions going on between God and Satan now about our suffering. Yet, Peter does write, your enemy the devil prowls round like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In other words, to destroy our faith in God's promises. But Satan is not free in the world. He is chained by his conqueror, who is Christ. Satan hates God and he hates us. But Christ will only allow Satan's malicious temptations when they will function positively in testing our faith. And so Peter simply says, resist him standing firm in the faith. In other words, you defeat the devil's temptations simply by clinging to God in his goodness. So Satan still hates us, but we are being tested. Suffering is Satan's temptation to reject God, but God's test to strengthen our faith. And so our own suffering and struggles, whatever they are, is our own opportunity to glorify God as Job did and as Jesus will do. Now as we prepare to follow Job into his sufferings in the rest of the book, we're introduced to three hopeless friends. And we're going to find that these silent friends leave Job in lonely suffering. So now as we begin to draw to an end, Pete's going to read verses 11 to 13. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathise with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognise him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. It's been suggested that saying nothing for a week was the best thing these friends did. And of course, it must be right that when we're trying to comfort those who are suffering, the worst thing we can do is to all utter all kinds of uh, nonsense platitudes. But tearing their robes and sprinkling ash on their heads was in the customs of the day to treat Job as if he was dead. And so their silence is not golden, but criminal. For like an unbelieving counsellor with nothing to say about God's compassion and mercy to comfort Job, they leave Job terribly and devastatingly alone for a week until he's eventually forced to say something himself. 
because they have nothing to say. Or those we shall see next week, when they do start speaking, they make things worse. And so in chapter 3 we find that Job wished he'd never been born. And it begins in chapter 3, verse 1, where Job says this. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Notice Job does not curse God, but in his misery he has nothing to look forward to. And so for a whole chapter of the deepest darkness, he laments the day that he was born. He looks back with sorrow. What Job's friends have failed to do here is what Paul says in Romans 12 when he says, weep with those who weep. He didn't need their silence leaving him alone. He needed their tears. He needed to know that they were with him. And eventually they needed to know about the God who still loved him. Now we will get to many of the things that Job will teach us about how to comfort those who are suffering. But it seems to me that now, instead of hearing a song, as we normally do at the end of our services, it would be more appropriate for us to spend a few minutes praying, to pray for those that we know who are suffering, so that they know that they are not left alone in despair without words. Let's pray that they will experience the compassion and mercy of God revealed to us most beautifully at the cross. Let's pray that they will trust that God does have a good purpose in their suffering, in helping them become more like Jesus. He does have a great future beyond their suffering in heaven forever. And above all, to know that in clinging to God in their suffering, like Job and like Jesus, they are glorifying God in heaven and on earth. They are witnessing to the greatness and goodness of God by clinging to God when life is hard and that one day they will be comforted. So may I suggest that wherever we are, whatever is going on around us, that we now just spend a couple of minutes in quiet prayer and then I'll lead us in a final prayer to end our service. Let's now pray for those we know who are suffering. Let me now lead us in a final prayer. Job glorified God in his suffering when he concluded, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And when he said, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Living and loving Lord, please help us when we suffer, not to curse you, but to cling to you knowing that by doing so in faith, we bring glory to you. And so we pray, please help us, not to curse you, but to cling to you, to remain confident of your love, knowing that you have a good purpose and a great future. Lord, please help us to cling to you in our suffering and to support others and to weep with others as they do the same. Please teach us through this book of Job, we pray, to be more like Job and therefore more like Jesus. We ask it for his glory.
and in his name. Amen.